Good morning, members. I confirm we have full attendance, so I will call the meeting to order. Um, can I welcome members who are particip participating today by telephone, which today is Orlea Flynn. Good morning, Orlea, and welcome to the meeting. And can I remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? Um, so we're moving straight into our first our session today, COVID-19 disease response. We're having a briefing from the Minister of Health and the Chief Medical Officer. Uh, good morning, Robin and Michael. How are you? So, members, we have a single item agenda today with the, both the Minister and the Chief Medical Officer at committee. Um, I refer members to papers at tab 2 of your pack and, your, and the table papers which you have received. I advise members that the Minister and the Chief Medical Officer are joining us today to update the committee on the COVID-19 crisis. I am sure we are all aware of the pressures they are under and grateful for their time today. Can I welcome Mr Robin Swan, Minister of Health, and Dr Michael McBride, Chief Medical Officer. So, if I could invite you, Robin, to brief the committee, and, and if I could ask you to be as brief as possible on that, I think the members are well up to speed in, in a lot of, the, a lot of the, the general issues, and we do want to get a, a good question and answer session in today, uh, in light of the fact that your, your time has been limited. So, I, and I, I appreciate that, Chairman. Um, can I thank you for facilitating the, I suppose, the change of date? Um, we were meeting; the executive was meeting on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and we moved two weeks ago to a Monday and Thursday. So, we're appreciative of you that you can facilitate this meeting on a, on a Wednesday. So, uh, Chair, as ever, thank you for the opportunity to update you on the latest developments regarding my department's ongoing response to COVID-19. And today's update, I hope, will paint a more optimistic picture than that which I provided the, the last time we met. A number of restrictions have now been eased, and we are seeing a steady fall in the death rate here in Northern Ireland. Both are positive and much welcomed developments. But I cannot and will not forget those families who are suffering and who will continue to suffer as loved ones uh, lose their battle to this horrendous disease. Chair, in this, which is Mental Health Awareness Week, I want to take a few moments to acknowledge the pain and loss being felt by families right now, the pressure being felt by our health and social care workers and the daily worries and concerns facing local people who have adapted their lives to adhere to the restrictions currently in place. Um, none of this was easy. None of this is comfortably with our way of normal way of life, and none of us are alone in feeling this way. That is why, just a number of weeks ago, I announced my intention to put in place a mental health champion who will work to further the mental health agenda to promote emo emotional health and well-being, and importantly, to promote uh, recovery. I'm pleased to say that the officials in my department are working to progress this new role as I speak, whilst also working with colleagues in the health and social care system and in the independent sector to provide help and support during these difficult times. As you will know, yesterday I published the Mental Health Action Plan, along with a dedicated COVID-19 response plan, which outlines the psychological well-being and mental health response to the current pandemic. Together, Chair, we will get through this. And nowhere is that more clearly illustrated than in the collective impact we have made in recent weeks by socially distancing to save lives. Before the introduction of social distancing, almost uh, three other people were infected by each COVID-19 <coughs> patient in the community. As a result of the effort we have undertaken together at great cost to your lives and liberty, each COVID-19 patient in the community now infects less than one other individual, and that is reflective in their R value being 0.7 to 0.8. Thankfully, the death rate for COVID-19 in Northern Ireland is decreasing. While some people are becoming overnight statisticians and epidemiologists with a tendency to make crude and often ghoulish comparisons in death rates, I would encourage everyone to pay attention to the actual evidence and not personal assessments presented as scientific fact. Chair, in reality, the CMOs on both sides of our border have said that the spread of the virus and the number of those who have, been, who have sadly passed away remains comparable. But I would like again to make the point that we must not get too hung up on the language of statistics, because we must never forget that behind every single figure was a person who was loved and who is now missed. In regards, Chair, since we last met, uh, in regards to the easing of some of the, the restrictions, while some adjustments are being made to restrictions as part of the first step of the Executive Recovery Plan, we must not let up 
with all the efforts that are being made, nor undo the hard-fought progress that has been made in flattening the curve. I must commend all our citizens to the tremendous compliance and tolerance that they have displayed. We are making really strong progress in slowing the spread of this virus because of the sum total of responsible actions being taken by individuals in our community. You will be aware last week the Executive announced our five-step plan to aid recovery and renewal, taking into consideration the most up-to-date scientific, scientific and medical advice. We are progressing our way through step one of that pathway, which has seen the reopening of garden centres and recycling centres um, from Monday of this week, as well as the important step of allowing marriage ceremonies to take place for those who are terminally ill and want to fulfil their personal wish to marry their loved ones. In addition, the Executive has also agreed that groups of up to six people who do not share a household can now meet outdoors so long as social distancing is followed. Churches will be able to open for private prayer. Outdoor activities, whether work or leisure, can take place. Again, these are dependent on social distancing being maintained and good hygiene, particularly where surfaces may be touched by more than one person. As a result of these and of these restrictions on outdoor activity, some sports, such as golf or tennis, can restart. I have said before, we need to take small steps as we move along the pathway to recovery. But we will, of course, keep all these things under review. While some restrictions may have been eased, the advice on shielding remains current. Anyone advised to shield by their GP or hospital specialist should, con should continue to do so until advised otherwise in order to protect themselves from infection. We are working at a national level to develop the future of the shielding programme. This work will carefully consider the need to protect people who are extremely vulnerable against the latest evidence of the risk posed by COVID-19. This is complex and detailed work, and we must ensure we get it right. We are now starting the long journey back to something closer to normality, but be assured that we have not lost sight of those who have had to shield. As our plans develop, they will include updated advice <coughs> and support for those shielding in their own homes. I have been clear that I will constantly seek ways to help care home staff and the vulnerable people they care for, safe and well in the face of this current pandemic. My department and the wider Health and Social Care Service have taken a host of measures to support the care home sector at this difficult time. Guidance on responding to COVID-19 in community and residential settings was first issued in February and has been revised and updated in line with emerging evidence since then, providing advice specifically for the care home sector on a range of issues, including PPE, infection and prevention, and control measures, visiting restrictions and testing. And the most recent up-to-date guidance was issued on the 26th of April. We have continued to expand testing in care homes in line with scientific advice and guidance. And as of yesterday, there have been 4,950 residents tested. That's almost 40% of our entire care home population. population. In addition, there have also been 4,816 of our care home workers tested. And Chair, as of 9 a.m. this morning, there are 70 homes with confirmed outbreaks of COVID-19, with a further 34 suspected or possible outbreaks, and 35 care home outbreaks have concluded since the start of the pandemic. Whilst we are by no means through the storm, I am reassured that the situation in our care homes has greatly stabilised especially when compared to the ongoing situation in care homes across the rest of the United Kingdom. Last week, I announced the deployment of testing capacity by the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service and up to 40 nurses from the HSC system. At the beginning of this week, I announced a further expansion so that COVID-19 testing will now be made available to all care home residents and staff across Northern Ireland. HSC trusts have stepped in to provide thousands of hours of free staffing time to homes that need it. And we have prioritised any professional staff returning to the HFC or deployment into the care home sector where their skills and experience match requirements. We also reached agreement with local universities to bring forward the qualification date for social workers, allowing them to enter the workforce several weeks earlier than would have otherwise been the case. The Health and Social Care Service has also supported care homes through the provision of PPE free of charge. By the end of the week just past, Trust has provided more than 1.5 million items of PPE to the independent sector care homes. I will continue to review emerging evidence and best practice locally, nationally and internationally, 
and will actively consider any other measures that have the potential to protect care home residents and staff. Building on that evidence last Friday, I issued guidance for care homes uh, on a protect proposed new model, Safe at Home. This model seeks to test the impact of staff living in or close to care homes on preventing the spread of infections. Measured aimed at safeguarding the financial resilience of care home providers by guaranteeing a level of income have been in place since the 17th of March. This has since been supplemented with a support package of up to £6.5 million to address the additional costs they have faced. However, I believe there remains scope to do more, and I intend to bring a paper to the Executive in the very near future that proposes an immediate priority additional support for care home staff. The allocation of £19.7 million additional funding to Northern Ireland from Westminster, um, while it will not automatically come to my department, would help to deliver this additional support. I am keen to give way to your questions as soon as possible, Chair, but if you will permit me, I would like to provide a short update on the work my department is progressing on test, trace, isolated and support strategy. This work is designed to break the chain of transmission of the virus by identifying people with COVID-19, tracing people who have been in close contact with them and supporting those people to self-isolate so that if they have the disease, they are less likely to transmit it to <coughs> others. Our Chief Medical Officer has established a strategic oversight board for that work, which will bring all the key elements together, namely testing, contact tracing, information and advice and support. Support from the public will be absolutely critical to the success of this strategy as we will be relying on citizens to report symptoms, be tested and to follow self-isolation advice if recommended. However, let me assure you that participation will be voluntary and people will have full control over what information they choose to disclose. We have tested the processes for contact tracing and as from Monday we have been undertaking, undertaking contact tracing for all confirmed positive cases of COVID-19. This service was built on a contact tracing pilot run by the Public Health Agency, which began on the 27th of April 2020. The pilot programme had been operating on a five-day week basis, the first of its type in the United Kingdom, and despite some slightly inaccurate reporting this morning, we now firmly move, have moved beyond the pilot phase. The service is now operating over a seven-day week. This will be a major commitment as we expect this service to be in place for the next year at least. As an illustration, Chair, on Monday, the 18th of May, we added 36 confirmed cases to the programme and successfully followed up on 35 of them. We already have sufficient numbers of enough trained contact tracers in place to trace all confirmed cases at the present time. There have also been a large number of volunteers who have come forward to offer to assist with this work with the Public Health Agency currently finalising job descriptions for the service. In conclusion, I would like to add that the number of COVID-19 patients requiring critical care, maintaining a gradual downward trend, it allowed the decision to reduce the escalation level for critical care to low surge. An illustration of that meant that last week when I announced the Nightingale Hospital at the Belfast Tower Block was being stood down. That was good news, especially it was going, as it was going to allow for the reintroduction of urgent surgery and a range of other key services <coughs> to be delivered from the site. I am acutely aware, however, of the severe impact that COVID-19 has had on a whole breadth of key services. So shortly I will pub publish a strategic framework for rebuilding the HSC services. But instead of waiting until that happens, I have also made it clear to the Trusts and to the Department that as soon as services can be turned back on, then I expect them to be, and that is already happening. As I said last week, before COVID-19, our waiting lists were awful. They'll now be frightening. It will require serious efforts and serious financial commitment to fix the damage that this virus has done. Yet it will also critically be important to recognise that there will not be a return to business as usual because COVID-19 will be with us for some time. There is no doubt that we have come a long way in a short time. The response by so many has been overwhelming, but being no doubt, there is much more still to do. And I'm now happy to take members' questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Minister. Um, 
I suppose in, in, in the first instance, I do want to acknowledge the, uh, the developments that there have been and the, the expansion of testing into the care home sector for staff and residents is welcome. The further deployment of nurses uh, and the commitment to proceed with, for investment in reform and adult social care, um, including care pathways, sick, sick training and that. Um, but I do want to focus on um, in relation to care homes. On the 5th of March, Sean Holland appeared here at the committee and I had, had asked him about the arrangements for care homes. He had told us on that occasion that, Mike, that the Chief Medical Officer, Michael McBride, was leading the effort to contain the spread of COVID. On the 23rd of April, in a meeting with the Health Committee, Chief Medical Officer stated, the important elements are that our health and social care system is ready for any surge. That will be right across from beds and hospitals, intensive care and, importantly, capacity in the community sector, in nursing homes and care homes, and making sure there are resilient surge plans. We are working very diligently right across the sector to ensure that this is in place. You are absolutely right, now is the time to do that. <coughs> so, uh, Chief Matter, con considering that the COVID-19 crisis has developed the way it has developed in the care homes, do you still believe that everything was done to ensure resilient surge plans were put in place within care homes? Well, well just to uh, well, thank you, Chairman. Um, for your question. And I think that from the very outset, uh, we made clear that, uh, and as I said in my comments previously, that a lot of preparation was going on right across health and social care. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the uh, focus, and certainly in terms of <clears throat> the uh, media focus, was on uh, the acute sector, particularly in relation to uh, ventilator capacity. Many of the questions uh, that we received were in relation to preparation into the acute sector. I think that was understandable because when you saw the reports uh, for other <coughs> European countries where you saw individuals not able to access uh, the level of care that would have secured a good, uh, a good outcome. But just to reassure you, all of that planning and preparation was underway within uh, health and broader social care. The independent sector, the care home sector, both nursing and residential uh, care homes, including domiciliary, and that work was led and coordinated by respective uh, organisations or health and social care trusts, uh, by policy colleague Sean and his team, and indeed uh, my, myself and my team to ensure that we had an integrated response. I think in terms of could we do more or could there have been more that have done, I think you know, there will come a time for us to look back and examine all that we have done to this point in time. There will absolutely be learning. Of, you know, make no shadow of a doubt about that. You know, we did not. We now know more about this virus uh, than we did at various points, weeks, and indeed months ago. And undoubtedly, there will be learning, and there will be things which we may have done differently. I mean, I'm again very happy to acknowledge that. In terms of what we did do and the steps that we did take, I think that we took uh, graduated steps at appropriate points in time. Uh, we issued our first uh, guidance to the independent uh, care home sector back on the 27th of February. We updated and revised that on the 13th of March, again on the 17th of March, again on the 26th of March. We repurposed our QIA on the 23rd uh, of March uh, from memory to provide support to the care home sector, particularly in relation to their needs in relation to PPE. We dedicated uh, resources within the public health agency, both our infection prevention control teams, our nursing teams and our health protection teams to provide support to the care home sector. As the Minister has said in his opening comments, we provide significant expertise and nursing hours uh, into the uh, care home sector. Uh, so I think our response from the outset has been comprehensive. Uh, I think it's been supportive. I think it's been detailed. Um, there will always be an opportunity to look back and say, could we have done more? Uh, but I think that um, the, as, as we look at how the care homes right across these islands have, have been impacted upon, uh, I think the responses uh, that we took, uh, the actions that we put in place, uh, actually have put us in as uh, uh, you know, tr the tragic consequences of this virus uh, is that it preferentially uh, attacks the frail, the elderly, and those with underlying conditions. I think that the impact on our care home sector could have been much worse had we not taken the steps at the time that we took those steps. But it's also been significant. So in terms of in terms of was it a mistake, for example, to continue to discharge COVID positive patients into a setting where it was hard to implement 
um, social distancing? Well, I, th I think what we're going to have to do at a point in time, Chair, is look back and analyse you know, the various factors and the decisions that we made. Uh, I don't think any of us sitting in this chamber today uh, looking at what was emerging across Europe, the people who were dying for not being able to access care uh, felt that it was anything other than appropriate that we ensured that we had uh, the capacity within our health care system to provide acute care, including hospital admission, intensive care admission, to those who were sickest. And let's also not forget that those who are sickest are often the oldest. You know, this virus preferentially at attacks uh, those who are older in our society. Given that we know that, and given that we have known for a number of weeks now that the surge has not been as bad as it may have been, due to some good work, and I, and I acknowledge that, should we not have more quickly moved to stop, uh, stop discharging <coughs> patients out of hospitals, and should we not do it yet? Well, I, I first with, called for this on the 1st of, on the 1st of April. With, should we not yet? With respect, Chair, with respect, Chair, you've got to also remember, at the time that we were making the capacity to treat people in hospital, including older people, including older people admitted from care homes. Mm. You know, what we also had to do is ensure that we protected those older people who were in hospital and fit to be discharged from not becoming infected in our hospitals. We've also got to bear in mind that at the time that we took the decision to discharge from hospitals for people who were fit to be discharged from hospital, we did not and still have had not had significant outbreaks in our hospitals. So to suggest that we had outbreaks within our hospitals and therefore we were discharging significant numbers of people into care homes. I haven't, suggest, I haven't suggested that for a minute. I haven't, I, I haven't suggested that for I a minute. The I, from I, the I, I, chair no, well, well, I, well, I don't know where you're drawing that inference. I'm asking simply where people have tested positive for COVID-19 or are awaiting the result of a test that those patients would not be discharged into a vulnerable setting until they have tested clear. What is hugely important is that everyone has access to the optimal care, irrespective of age, uh, and actually they are treated in the most appropriate care environment. At the time that we discharged individuals into the care home sector, we had not at that stage had significant levels of community transmission, and we still did not have and have had, no, thank goodness, significant outbreaks in the hospital sector. And I think if we look at the evidence base, and I think it's important we do look at the evidence base um, in terms of how infections enter care homes, the very fact of the vulnerability of, of individuals and the fact that there has to be footfall in and out of care homes because individuals there need uh, very personal care with the activities of daily life that you and I take for granted, and that irrespective of how diligent we are uh, in relation to PPE, infection prevention control, this is a highly transmissible virus. And um, what, what you refer to evidence there, Michael, what evidence are you basing your assertion last week that, uh, that the virus was going into care homes via staff? What evidence is that, that it was via staff rather than via admissions out of hospital? Again, Chair, that's a misrepresentation of what I did say. I made no such assertion. I said what it would require is a piece of detailed analysis and work to understand the various routes of uh, transmission into care homes. I think if you look at the actual detail of what I said, I think unfortunately, again, the headline uh, over that was not what I said. Uh, and what I am happy to pr uh, provide for the committee is the evidence base for other pandemics, given the fact that what we do know is that uh, in quite a number of outbreaks of infectious diseases, it is the uh, movement of staff and others from the community in terms of visitors uh, that actually can introduce infections into any enclosed environment, whether that's care homes uh, or whether that's other settings. Uh, and okay. unfortunately, it's a matter of deep personal regret, and let me put this on record, that media reporting of that um, indicated that the chief medical officer was blaming uh, health care workers. Nothing could be further from the truth. As I said in that same uh, response to that question, the enemy here is the virus. Uh, the health care workers who are providing personal care in the care home sector are the heroes in this, yeah. uh, going in, providing care, uh, putting themselves at times in harm's way, and looking after the very basic needs. Yeah, I think, I think we all accept that, Michael. And my questioning is not calling into question the frontline staff. We, we appreciate that. It's, it's calling, and, and I do have a concern, and I, I do understand that there will be a time to look back. However, this is a live, dynamic situation, and we don't actually have time 
we need to be learning and implementing the learning of lessons in, in real time, yeah. dynamically. Yes, yes you mind if I, and I think that's what, you know, in my opening statement, I think that's what I said in regards to how we look at international uh, best practice as to what has been done elsewhere. You know, the Safe at Home uh, project is one, uh, you know, it's an opportunity we have. We actually saw it um, from another independent care home provider here in Northern Ireland, and we as a department picked it up to try and roll it out across other care homes. We try and reduce the number of, of people who are actually entering our care homes at, the, at this point in time. I visited a care home um, a, a couple of days ago, and I was, I was still working through a live outbreak. Uh, and they, they, were, they were appreciative of the, of the support that they were getting, but um, the challenges that they were facing by reducing the footfall coming in through, they were feeling from the support of families, uh, to them as staff, to the support of families, that were coming into the residence as well, but what they were telling what they were telling me is from both staff and from from the families that I spoke to as well, they knew it was tough, and they knew this was a hard time to go through. But they realised the steps that were being taken were for the right for the right reason. So, in regards, are there things that we can <coughs> learn? Are there things that we are changing? Are there things that we are adapting as we go through this pandemic that has been here in Northern Ireland for the past number of weeks? Yes, they are. We're, we're responding, and we're responding. I think we're responding quickly. Uh, in regards to, and, and members in this chamber will know, in the past when we tried to change something in the health <coughs> service, it would have took months, if not years, chair. We've responded in, 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 a, in a matter of weeks. In regards, you know, will we look? Will we look back and learn? We're already looking at what's been done elsewhere, and we are already learning. That's why the Four Nations Health Ministers' calls are useful. That's why the calls with. Minister Harris and the, uh, the Tonish to First Minister, Deputy First Minister and the Secretary of State are useful as well because we can, we can share that, that information. But I, I think it's important that we use this stage to learn and to adapt. There will be a time for inquiries and evidence gatherings, but let's do it when we have fought through this battle. Because I think one of the things we should not allow. But let's also agree we don't have the luxury of time. Yeah. As, well, and that's why I'm saying that's yeah. why I'm saying, Chair, you know, we have to adapt and we have to adapt and learn from best practice now. And I think we are when when we look at international best practice and we start to make those changes. It's nothing that um, we are doing is so set in stone that it's not adaptable and to change. Okay. You know, and I think that's the point I, I want to make. But but also in regards to to your inquiries and asking questions, could we done if, could we have done something different knowing now? The speed this virus has progressed through Northern Ireland and through the healthcare system and across the world, you know, we're talking about weeks. So what we know now about this virus and how it behaves, nobody knew in January. Because this was an this was a a, a new virus that was was at, was attacking us and tackling us. So, so, Chair, I hope that's that's useful. But but there are there are things about all virus and all pandemics that rules that apply across them. The, the, those playbooks have been written, despite the fact there are novel things about coronavirus, and we all accept that there are there are certain things in terms of tests, just isolate, in terms of stopping social interaction, all of that. I'm going to move on because I want to give members an opportunity. But, but sorry, um, Chair, can, can I just come back in, in regards to all pandemics? And you mentioned testing. We've never managed a pandemic uh, like COVID-19, where testing was so important or actually utilised to the extent that it has been. You know, when we when we when we tried to deal with SARS, um, avian swine flu, all the rest of it, we weren't doing the same testing programmes that we are now. We never went into yeah. the isolation phase and the lockdown phase that we did now, because this virus is like nothing else we have combated. It is so virulent. Okay. It is so deadly as well, you know. So that's that's one of the things and that I, we're I think the very about. important. But again, it's important to emphasise this: the only pandemics that we have dealt with in the last decade and our hundreds of our de decades have been flu pandemics. And you think back to 2009, 2010, we didn't test extensively for H1N1. We had surveillance in place, community surveillance. This virus is different. Yep. You know, it, it, the same rules do not apply. This is a highly transmissible virus, more infectious than flu virus. We did not have, te we, you know, I think we often forget that outside of China, no one knew about this virus until the end of December. We did not have a test 
uh, in the United Kingdom, and indeed we're one of the first countries to have tests uh, until that, that was one of the big advantages we had at the start. We had so, testing, uh, uh, so but, but the tracing, but what I'm the saying, tracing was, was well, stopped. Well, the only the only point I would make, and I'm sure we'll come on to that, and we, we, as we have done every time we've been to the committee, and I'm sure we'll come on to it this time again because it's an important issue, and obviously happy to take questions on it, uh, is that um, the the to say that this is like any other virus, I think, um, as Minister has said, this is different than any other pandemic that we have had this century. Um, See, I'm, I'm not saying I, I actually I actually acknowledge that there are novel elements to this, so I'm not saying it's like any pandemic. What I'm saying is there are certain there are certain things in pandemics that that truisms that. that exist. That. Okay, I'm going to move on to members. Alex, first there, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose I need to declare my sister's a nurse and she's got COVID, so she's currently off sick at the moment. Um, so that's just to keep myself right. Um, thank you for your presentation, and um, Minister and the Chief Medical Officer. Um, I believe you're doing the best possible job that you can, uh, and I want to acknowledge that to you. Um, my first uh, question is to do with, um, I believe, and I, I may be wrong, but um, there are two wards closed in the Ulster Hospital and a whole floor in Lagan Valley. Um, what's the extent of closures of wards due to lack of staff because they've been infected with COVID? Um, can you maybe give us an update on how many staff are actually have contacted COVID? Um, thanks, Alec. First of all, can pass on our best to your sister okay. and speedy recovery for the work and thank her for the work that she's doing. Um, the last figures that I have, and there's a figure I carry now to, to every brief, no matter where I go. Um, Alec, the, the last. Um, number of staff who were absent due to a, a positive COVID, and this is across the, the National Health Service, due to a positive COVID uh, test is 284, which is the equivalent of 0.4% of our entire staff population. We have 1,792 um, who are self-isolating, and that's equivalent to 2.5%, and they may be self-isolating due to a family member or due to having been received of a, of a shielding letter. So it's in the region of 2.9% of our entire staff is currently off either because of a positive COVID result or because of their self-isolation as well, which out of um, comparison with 4.8% uh, of our staff population off due to medical reasons as well. So in the comparison of the two, it's it's a good place to be, but in regards to people like your sister, it's not a good place to be because we know they've been there doing the work and we want to get them back full health and back to, to the front line as soon as possible. Okay. Next uh, question is going on to nursing homes. <laughs> um, it's something I don't understand. In nursing homes, the majority of people that seem to be getting infected are the elderly, which I, I, I do understand. What I don't understand in nursing homes is some of them are no doubt being admitted to hospital, but a lot of those that are dying are dying in the nursing homes. And I can't understand why they haven't been admitted to hospital. Is, is there any reason for that or any explanation for that? And also, um, in terms of the testing, you've mentioned about residents 495 or 4,950, which is good. And that's been done. And, and, and also staff 4,816, which is good. Out of those that you've tested so far, do we have a number of how many have actually tested positive? Um, I have that figure somewhere. Our chief medical officer will have it to hand. Sorry. Um, of, of the staff um, who have tested, we're looking at uh, just under 11% of staff have tested pos positive in our care homes. And in regards to the residents who have been tested, it's around about 17 per cent. And to put that into perspective uh, as well, you know, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not insignificant numbers, but because of our testing program has started in those homes where there are infections or, or suspected infections, we're mm -hmm. testing that cohort first. So we're expecting those numbers to be higher. And as we move into the rest of those, you know, the other 300 odd homes that currently haven't uh, COVID-19 infections, well, that <coughs> percentage-wise will start to come down. But it's important that we, we focus our testing capacity at, at the start where those homes 
our COVID positive or have suspected outbreaks in the, the place of, of treatment or the best place of treatment for, for a patient alarm. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think medical. that, um, you know, if you look right across the, the United Kingdom, there's some 400,000 uh, individuals in um, care homes, um, you know, significantly more beds in the care home sector than there are in the, in the acute sector. Um, and the vast majority of those individuals are over 80 years of age, and there's a preponderance uh, of females in that population as well, because you know we, women live longer than us males. Um, many of those have very complex needs, um, significant uh, underlying health problems, two or more, often three or more uh, underlying health conditions, and many of them, uh, but not all, uh, will ha have dementia. Uh, many of them, but not again, not all, um, may be in the last months or year of life. And what happens when someone becomes unwell in a care home, uh, and we mustn't forget this because I think sometimes this gets, does get lost, is that most people, irrespective of age, recover from COVID-19. And I, you know, and I think that the, you know, the tragic loss and, of life and the numbers that we see in the, you know, behind every one of those is a, is a tragedy, personal loss, you know, a grandparent, a grand, uh, uh, and a, a relative, um, that most people, irrespective of age, will still recover from this. Obviously, that becomes less likely as you get over 70 and over 80 years age in particular. Um, what is appropriate is a, a discussion will take place between family and relatives, um, with the staff in uh, any individual case in the particular care home about what the most appropriate care for that individual is. Um, we need to bear in mind that these are individuals' homes, um, and we need to consider what the right care is, and obviously the relatives, the general practitioner and, and others in the home will discuss that. That's obviously a very sensitive matter. It's an issue which you would expect, but looking at the holistic needs of, of an individual and whatever is the most appropriate care for that individual will be the care that that individual uh, receives. If that involves um, and it's felt it's most appropriate for that individual to be transferred into the hospital environment for acute care, then they will, that's, that is the care uh, that will receive. The uh, Minister announced um, last week, I believe it was, that we have also been bringing hospital care, as it were, into the care homes. We, uh, the Minister directed that and worked with, uh, we've worked with our, our hospital trusts, the acute care at home teams, the enhanced care at home teams, working with general practice, respiratory nurse specialists, uh, doing virtual ward rounds, uh, telephone consultations, so that we're uh, providing the appropriate skill, sorry, appropriate support uh, for those staff working in the care home sector. Uh, and again, that's something which I think one of the things which, uh, as Minister also said in his previous statement, one of the learning points from this is if ever we needed to learn this was the fact the care home sector is not what it used to be. The level of acuity uh, of individuals, as Minister has said, um, you know, nursing homes effectively are providing care that used to be in the, in the old care of the elderly wards. Uh, some years ago, uh, nursing homes are now providing that care, and residential homes are essentially providing the level of care that um, nursing homes used to provide. Thank you. So the answer is, whatever is the most appropriate care for that individual will be the care uh, that they receive, whether that's to maintain their treatment and support in a care home, or whether it's a transfer to a, a hospital environment. Thank you. Chair, um, just, yes, just to point yeah. out in regards to that best practice thing, um, we developed that, that virtual ward round visit for care homes that the Chief Medical Officer announced there, you know, and not to blow our own trumpet. You know, three days later, Man, Matt Hancock announced a similar system uh, for NHS in England. So there is the sharing of practice. It's not all about ownership or, or keeping those ideas ourselves. Once we develop and we see them work and we share them. I'm all, I'm all for that. We don't need to be, we can be the exemplar. There's no reason why we need to follow people. So all for that. Uh, just, just, just to be clear, I've kind of advised members that everyone has sort of approximately five minutes here to get. So where one of you can answer a question, that, that's fine. Um, we'll try and keep within that five minute period of time. But thank you, thank Colin. Thank you, a double act now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you uh, for the work that's been done to date. I acknowledge the remarks that were made earlier. Um, Minister, to date, um, and since the week beginning, the 3rd of April, there have been 766 excess deaths in Northern Ireland when compared with the average number of deaths for the five-week period previously. Um, there's a suggestion that 568 of those are related to COVID, and that leaves us about 200 above and beyond what we would normally have. Um, 
Beyond the obvious, what concerns you most about that figure of 200 additional deaths that we don't know what's caused it? Well, well, I think that's what the bit that concerns me most, Colin, uh, as we don't know what, what, what caused it. But when you look, uh, and I suppose it's the NISRA uh, statistics that we look to to get those excess deaths, we're fortunate uh, in Northern Ireland that we do have NISRA that can take out that sort of analysis and does that sort of clinical analysis very well. But it, it is that piece of work where we have to look at over, over that five week period that you talk about from the 3rd of April to due to the, through to the 1st of May where those additional deaths occurred, what is the underlying condition. Um, and that's a piece of work that, that is ongoing. But we also take um, you know, notice when, when we looked at the last one, the weekend on the 8th of May, um, the reduction of the excess deaths then come down to, I think, was it 62? Mm -hmm. We are starting mm -hmm. to see a tapering back down um, of the differential between the excess deaths and, and the, the average number of expected deaths as well. So while we were at peak, uh, COVID-19, uh, we were seeing an excess um, or an additional excess deaths as well. So as, as, as a number of COVID deaths come down, that peak's closing as well. Does, does that not suggest then that those people died of coronavirus if their numbers are coming down at the same rate that the coronavirus is coming down, which actually means that the number of people that have A, died from coronavirus is much higher because that excess death figure is 25% bigger. Um, and also, say for example, 10% of those, which would be 20 people, were within nursing homes and care homes. Then there's people that we haven't diagnosed as having uh, coronavirus that were actually there. And as each person transmits it on, we, we, there's just, it's been passing out and out. And I, I know this comes full circle to the question that we just needed to ramp up the whole concept of testing much, much, much sooner because it would have uh, shown uh, that these people did have that. But is that not a correlation that's that's obvious? I hate to say anything's an obvious correlation when it comes to to the NISRA reporting because you know they're the experts in what they're doing in this and they've, they've been a vital tool. Uh, I think one of the things that we've seen in regards to when they, we get that weekly NISRA update on a Friday, uh, they do the full analysis piece of every death certificate. So where COVID um, has been suspected, not just a test. So. That, that's, they start to close that differential of only COVID deaths that have tested positive as well. So it's that excess death piece that there is a further piece of work being done on to see to see exactly the reason and the location as well. And we might get a, a the chief medical officer. People, as my colleague Daniel McCrossan raised me last week, there are people that are having coronavirus listed as their reason for death, even though they haven't had a positive test. So they're actually included in the figures of people that have had coronavirus. So these are people above and beyond that again. I, I, I'm a bit concerned, just, uh, and I have been right from the start about how we record who has this. I think in my very first health meeting, I asked you a question about that and, uh, and yeah. got a forthright answer that there was nothing to be worried about. But I sort of feel like now, six weeks down the line, there, there are some things there that we should be concerned well, about. And, and I suppose that, that is the issue that, that, that Daniel raised in regards to COVID-19 being on a, on a death certificate where the family were, I suppose, 100% that wasn't there. Since he raised that, I've had another MLA raised a similar case. So I, that's what I say. I, yeah. Again, I promised Daniel we would go and look into how that can be challenged on a death certificate. If oh. there's purpose to it, or actually can be done. I had a constituent yesterday as well. It's cancer in this case, but um, in, in the chamber last week, you said that you would issue get the guidance yeah. to members. How it could be challenged? That's okay. right. Just, just yeah. a, if I might, Chair, yeah. uh, I mean, you make a very, very valid point. I mean, I think that, as Minister has said, uh, and obviously, I mean, I know we're paraphrasing, but certainly, I worry about every death. Yeah. Um, and but there is an issue. You're absolutely right about trying to understand what. The statistics are telling us, you know, setting aside the fact that these are individual deaths and loss. But, you know, what, are the, what are the statistics telling us? Um, I think one of the things which we were very concerned about, and, and Minister repeatedly made this message, was that uh, many people were staying away uh, from health care uh, because of two things. One, I think there's no doubt, and you know, talking to family and friends, those who otherwise would have attended with an underlying health condition or, a, or an acute new symptom, were concerned that attending a hospital that they would themselves put themselves at COVID-19. So I think uh, should you know, may have should and should have gone to hospital uh, when they chose not to, and that may be a factor. Um, we did see significant uh, reductions in attendances to our emergency departments, uh, and also um, 
there is no doubt that um, people were concerned about putting too much burden on the health service. Um, so I think people stayed at home who should have come, uh, and that's a concern and a real concern for me. I think in terms of, um, we have issued uh, guidance on two occasions now to, uh, to the medical profession about uh, the completion of death certificates where there is either confirmed positive case or suspected. They can very clear, if it's suspected at all, put it on the death certificate. So I'm uh, as confident as I can be that we're accurately recording those that are um, COVID related. But as the Minister said, yeah. I don't think it's going to be for some many, many months and, and maybe longer until we look back and we see the excess deaths that have occurred in this period, those that have been directly as a result of COVID-19 uh, and confirmed, those that have been suspected, those that are indirectly as a consequence of that, and perhaps those deaths that tragically where people's lives have been shortened. You know, many, many may have died within a year, but their Thank life expectancy is shortened. Can I just uh, um, ask you I'm going to have to move on now. Yeah. Go, go very quickly. Fred, uh, Chief Medical Officer, you should know that. Northern Ireland's not a big place. If there's 200 people who have died here in the last five weeks, you should be able to tell me exactly what they've died of and what the occurrence was. It, to me, it seems strange that we have a medical service that doesn't know why people are dying. And, and I know well, you said that there's sorry, a piece of work there. So can you tell me what that piece of work is? Because I think people out there will not want to know that if in the next six weeks there's 100 die, that we'll be able to work out why. Colin, Colin I don't think that, that, that's accurate. And, and what was actually meant is the piece of work that we've, uh, no, we'll ask Nezra to do in regards to because they're, they are the, the official record keeper, for want of a better word. So it's a piece of analysis that has to be done on those additional death certificates that's presented to them, and that no. you know, death certificate has main cause of death and then underlying factors as well. So it's, it's, it's a bigger piece of work than just simply counting just, just to off, confirm that. Because, yeah. of the, because of the sensitivity yeah. it is. You know, this isn't a tick box counting exercise. The, just the GRO, the Registrar General, and NISR provide us essential that, that the analysis is carried out by the experts in the statistics who will look at all of this, will produce and do produce quarterly reports. So they're obviously producing weekly reports at present, produce quarterly reports uh, and annual reports, which basically informs us as departments, Red Cross government, about policy priorities, including that very important analysis uh, that you've just indicated. That is not work that I undertake as chief medical officer, but what, what I do uh, do is take the statistical analysis and actually use that to provide advice to minister on areas where we may need to prioritise resource or where the, where we may, might need to develop policy. But again, that detailed analysis is carried out by NISRA under the auspices of GRO within the Department of Finance. Thank you. Uh, Pam. Thank you, and thank you, um, Minister and, and uh, Chief Medical Officer, for being here today. I appreciate your expertise in particular, Michael. Um, on the back of uh, the discussion there about the um, non-COVID deaths and the recording of deaths, the addition of the um, symptoms, the loss of Osmia, yeah. taste and um, smell, do you see that having an impact on the numbers of deaths recorded? being attributed to COVID-19? Um, that would be my first question. And um, I wanted to ask as well about um, whether the, the addition of those symptoms will have an impact on those shielding um, and whether there is an intention to issue any form of extension to those um, people who are shielding in terms of time and will they receive um, further communication directly on shielding advice? Um, I'll pick up on the shielding one, the Chief Medical Officer. Can, uh, in, in regards to, to the, the 80,000 people that have been written out to uh, with direct shielding, and that's because of the medical medical conditions rather than just those who are, who are over, over 70 and of a certain age, that has been reviewed currently by ourselves with advice to, to the executive, because if we do continue our current shielding policy, um, as where we're advising people with underlying medical conditions to, to stay at home and, and to shield themselves from the virus. We also have to be able to provide them the supports as well, should it be in regards to supports from the Department of from Communities, in regards to the, the food boxes that they have been supplying as well, or should it be direct pharmacy deliveries as well. So that's something that's currently been reviewed. and. My, my instinct at this minute in time, uh, I have not the direct scientific advice, I would estimate that we will be extending that shielding period for how long. Um, we haven't finalised that yet, 
but as in regards to this virus is still out there, the people who received the shielding letters, the 80,000 uh, plus people, still are those who are the most vulnerable and most susceptible to the ravages of this virus. So as we come out of our, our lockdown and the different steps, our advice and guidance will be, will be updated and supplied to them. But I think it's also important that we clarify the difference between those who are also over 70, who can start to, if they haven't, if they're not in receipt of a shielding letter, should be following the general guidance and advice. Um, anyway, shielding is a recommendation for that that cohort of people. So when it comes to coming outdoors and meeting in groups of six that can socially distance, you know, there's nothing precluding them because shielding isn't actually part of the regulations. As part of advice and guidance that have come out, just very briefly, then in terms of um, in terms of the addition of anosmia, loss of smell and taste, no, I don't. I don't believe that will have any impact on uh, those uh, deaths recorded as COVID nineteen related, nor any impact on, on shielding at all. But what it will do, uh, and it has always been recognised as a symptom, but there has been growing uh, international evidence and within the UK that. Uh, to the extent that we have now decided that it should be a trigger symptom. Um, whilst it's always been listed in that, and there's lots of atypical and non-specific symptoms, uh, we now feel there's sufficient evidence that, uh, that it can be an early symptom, even sometimes in some individuals before the onset of call for fever, uh, so that we catch as many people as we can, and I use that word uh, you know, just to emphasise the point, at the early stage when they start to develop symptoms and advise them to isolate uh, for their households to isolate, to get a test, uh, so that particularly as community transmission falls and we move into the phase of test, trace, isolate, support, that we can uh, ensure that we keep the R number as low as we possibly can and break chains of infection. Now, we will also keep those symptoms continue under review, as, as I mentioned to the Chair earlier. Our knowledge is growing all of the time, um, and it may well be that as we move into the autumn and winter, that we, because again, there will be more symptoms then of, which are not really related to COVID-19, but could be confused as COVID-19, because some of the symptoms are atypical, that we may need to make further modification uh, and changes. Okay. In terms of shielding, absolutely. I mean, we will keep that under review, absolutely re recognise the impact that this is having on individuals, you know, and certainly before the 12-week period is up, well, as I say, we'll be providing advice to ministers on, on terms of, in terms of next steps. Thank you. And this is a this is a quick one, Chair. Um, speech and language therapists, and I've obviously raised it um, before, and um, I've just received a bit of information that Wales have um, now given um, access to full code red PPE um, when required, obviously, by uh, Trust Infection Control on the back of the um, Royal College of Speech and Language and Therapists evidence paper. So, and obviously, the speech and language therapists are looking for uh, the department to make a local adjustment on the guidelines to 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 reflect the same in Northern Ireland. Are you anywhere closer to doing that? Because obviously we're well into this pandemic and you know these speech and language therapists are doing an incredible work on the front line and are very much at risk. And uh, in order to look <coughs> after both the patient and the staff, I think it's vital that, that, that they do receive that. I'm glad it wasn't a long one, Pam. <laughs> I gave the member the commitment on Thursday. Thursday last week, I think it was when we were in the chamber that we were looking at to update that guy. Especially, um, it was dysphagia. Dysphagia. Dysphagia, yeah. close. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the the swallowing cough. It was more the cough that is as the concern of the speech and language therapist. But you know, it is it is guidance that has been currently reviewed and will be updated. I, 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 very quickly, but I think that obviously in terms of the guidance that is there. Sorry, apologies. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's important that staff feel safe, and um, you know, the evidence can be one thing. But it's actually whether actually staff feel safe, irrespective of what the evidence says. And I think that we need to recognise that. Uh, and indeed, the current guidance in PPE does recognise that. It may well be, as community transmission hopefully continues to fall, that staff may feel more confident in certain situations where they may not feel confident at present. So, you know, it's a combination of evidence, but also the practicalities of, of staff need to feel safe. Uh, when they're providing care for patients. Can I just ask quickly again, w when will that decision be made? Well, I mean, I, I would, I would assume for probably within the next uh, number of days, week or so. But we liaise very, we liaise, and again, I'm not being, uh, I'm not trying to duck the question, but I know that there will be a further call with my CMO colleagues, for instance, this evening. Um, and we have further conversations on this and a range of other related issues. This is, it isn't the only example. 
Uh, but you're absolutely correct. We do need to have a unified position on it, and rather than send mixed messages to various professional groups. We'll come back to you in days. Thank you. All right. Jerry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I refer you to the case of uh, Anne McConnell. She's a constituent of mine. I think it's uh, potentially uh, could be uh, the pattern, unfortunately, across uh, other uh, people and other families. Her, her father was admitted to a care home on the 16th of March, and he sadly died on the uh, 11th of April. Um, the care home that he was admitted to, uh, there was a number of concerns raised about infection prevention. In 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020, this year, and he was sent in without any explanation to the family of concerns uh, raised. So I'm concerned the possibility that there could be a pattern uh, of behaviour here, and it could point towards systemic feelings that has you know, led to potentially uh, hundreds of deaths in, in, in care homes. Um, and I, uh, there is a concern not just amongst uh, um, myself and people that I've talked to but wider field that there could be a connection between complaints raised and deaths. Um, Ring Dufferin, uh, deaths there, uh, infection prevention concerns raised, Glen Abbey Manor, Parkview, or more, uh, our ladies, and just those are the ones that I'm aware of. Um, so I'm very concerned about that there could be, like I said, a pattern of, of, of behaviour there. And it's worth saying that this obviously isn't about the staff, many of whom are, are agency workers, but um, about a system of for-profit uh, care, which, uh, is very worrying uh, indeed, and, and just to bring your to your attention, um, CMO Minister, if you're not aware, uh, I raised um, several weeks ago, as other members did, with the RQIA, um, asked about what plan specifically was in place around care homes and residential homes, and we were referred to uh, winter preparation plans that existed, and this obviously isn't a, a flu or anything like that, as, as people uh, are aware. And, and I think uh, the CMO mentioned about, obviously, there's been a novel virus, that's obviously the case, but I'm concerned, and I think many people are concerned, that there's a pattern of behaviour in terms of, if not neglect, and certainly a, a looking over or ignoring or not following up on concerns raised uh, about care homes. Uh, I, I think it was the 20th of March, yourself, Michael, you raised um, with the RQIA to stop uh, inspections um, on uh, care homes. Uh, my understanding is from the 20th of March to the 30th of April, there was only one on site a physical inspection uh, at a nursing or residential home. Uh, I would ask if you could confirm if that's the case, and if it is, that's certainly very worrying and very low um, indeed. And I think just to conclude, it's all concerning all this uh, in and of itself, but especially as we're saying, or we're being told that the R rate can't be calculated or added to in care homes. Uh, we're, we're told the, the lockdown is going to be eased, um, and there's suggestions. Um, not from hurlers on ditches, uh, but from experts, that the death rate uh, could indeed be, be higher. So I just wanted uh, uh, to see if the CMO and Minister could respond to those points. Thank you. I suppose, Gerry, to start with, in regards to the care home structure in Northern Ireland, I think I've been very clear in the Chamber in regards mm -hmm. to, to where I see uh, our care home sector should be better funded, should be better supported uh, centrally. Uh, and that's. That, that's an indication of, of where I see that, that would be my my personal politic as to where I see that sector should be moving, and I think it's it's where we we've, we've allowed that sector to move to, not under um, and I think you're right, not under any direction of the workers in it or the people who are even managing the homes as well. So there's a bigger piece of work that needs to be done, uh, and that's why we're able, you know, the support package, the six and a half million that we put in to, to support was actually put in. With the workers, there's another piece of work been done uh, in regards to those care home workers, domiciliary care, care workers who are, are positive with COVID, but also have had to go off just on statutory sick pay as well. You know, those are the people that that we need to be supporting. So there's a, there's a greater piece of work that needs to be done in regards to how we support the care home sector and the domiciliary care sector, because they've been the Cinderella service. You know, they've they've, they've been the one. That, that even you know, Northern Ireland Healthcare, Northern Ireland PLC, we've always accepted them as being there and doing something that not an awful lot of people wanted to do. Now I think it's time that we, when, when the executive, when the assembly, when the people of Northern Ireland the bid and they realise the service that these individuals, these workers, are are doing, it's time we brought them in light and give them the support that they actually need to do the job that they want to do. Because that's one of the things that's coming into this post and visiting the care homes. 
it's a vacation for them as much uh, as anywhere else in the health service. They love what they do and they love the people they're looking after and they're the second family to all those. So there's a duty of responsibility in all of us, uh, as me as Minister, to make sure that we get that support piece into the care homes, the domiciliary care package. Now, it's unfortunate that it took this pandemic to bring it to the forefront, but now is the, now is the time to get it right and, and the other regards and the, the RQIL at the, the same. Yeah, uh, uh, Jerry. Thanks for your question. I mean, I think that you know, as um, working uh, myself and working with the uh, chief uh, uh, service officer, uh, Phil Holland, chief nursing officer Charlotte McCardle, um, we are using a, a range of intelligence uh, and evidence, both internationally and evidence that we've developed uh, locally in terms of perhaps some care homes that may be at, at greater risk. Um, and um, there's a range of sources of information that we're using in that regard, and that's really important because we need to use that to target our testing in care homes and our interventions and support to care homes, so just to reassure you that we are doing that. Um, back to the point I made earlier about footfall into care homes, uh, we made a decision to step back the frequency of inspections in care homes, not to, not to stop inspection in care homes. And as you indicated, uh, there have been inspections in care homes where Indeed, those have uh, required to happen, and there were concerns. I don't have those exact numbers uh, for you. Um, what we also did, which I think has, um, I, th I believe the care home sector has found um, of benefit, is we did take an early decision to repurpose our QIA staff, remembering that these are experienced nursing staff and social workers to actually provide support to the care home sector, working in conjunction, as I mentioned earlier, with public health agency, the infection prevention control nurses in PHA and the health protection teams, public health agencies. I think RQIA have provided a vital role in that. RQIA uh, are in daily contact with care homes. Um, we um, have... Um, I, think, I think they are. Nobody suggesting that's no, not no. the case. I, th I think the problem, though, uh, through the chair is that there's complaints, there's a pattern of complaints, and there's a feeling that there's no action. And also, just to answer, if you can, a question, uh, is there a connection between complaints raised and deaths at care homes. Um, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that uh, you know that is something which we were looking at a range of intelligence that might steer us towards that. I think also we also need to bear in mind that many homes will have concerns raised by uh, the regulator, and many of those issues are addressed. Um, and, and the importance about inspection is that it drives improvement, and that's what it's about. about imp improve, driving improvement and supporting. Uh, residents and, and allowing care homes uh, to improve. I think the other um, you know, point um, that I would make is that um, I genuinely uh, believe that the support that we provided by RQIA into the care home sector has been extremely beneficial to the, to the care home sector. We also have um, developed, and RQI have developed, a, a checklist aid memoir for uh, health and social care staff who, uh, by virtue of their role and responsibilities, do have to uh, uh, visit care homes uh, to ensure that if they uh, become aware of anything that causes concern, that there's a mechanism by which they can raise uh, those concerns so that they can sort of be the eyes and ears on the ground because that's again, true. And just through the chair quickly, chair. Very I mean, quickly, now because we do was, need to move. It was my figures show that there was only one inspection, on eight inspection between the 20th of March and the 30th of April. I mean, that's. Uh, can you confirm whether that's the case? I, I don't have those figures. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, certainly, if it would be helpful to the member, certainly, Jerry, very happy to get those figures from RQA. Sorry, chair. Just in, in your first comment, Jerry, in regard to your constituent, if you want to get as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, OK, I'm going to Paula. Um, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming this morning. My um, substantial question relates to those parents who have children at home living with disabilities um, um, who are in receipt of direct payments. Apparently, there's going to be um, new guidance coming out for social workers next week uh, around flexibility. Are, is there going to be um, provision there that where the carer is no longer coming into the home, that they're going to be able to use some of the money then to pay family members because they're providing 24-7 care? very complex needs, very draining, and they would like to know whether that's something that's going to be possible. It's, it's capable in England, but not here. And also then whether they're going to be able to use some of the money for to purchase sensory equipment, because obviously they're not in their, in their schools and they're getting that. So that's something they want clarity on. Um, the second um, issue of, of concern, uh, as you know, that the trusts are now um, um, 
There's a system where the trusts are requested um, to provide PPE. Um, there was a SIM call with a lot of these parents on Monday this week, and some of them were waiting up to five weeks to get the PPE from the health trust. So they've agreed to supply it, but they're not getting it. So they're still getting carers coming into home. So that's not good enough. Um, the other part in relation to this is that some of the children are moving between the home and then um, care settings, I think something like Ivy, if you think of that as an example. How are those children um, being factored into the testing programme? Are they, are they getting testing as they're leaving the care home to go back into the family home? And, and I suppose that information, um, um, the families want that. If you answer those, I'll come on the smaller questions. Um. In regards to, to your, I think your substantive, if you call upon in regards to, <coughs> to the payment support, I, I don't know. We haven't updated that at the moment, but it's something we can go and look, look at now in regards to, to where England is, and we have to liaise them with the Department for the Communities as well. And, and support to, if they're spending any period of time, are, are these people who are spending overnight, or are they solely no, there well, for well, a day? What would happen is they would have, they are in receipt of direct payments at the minute. They have carers who are coming yeah. in, but they're not coming in anymore because yeah. they're shielding. So they're, yeah. as a family yeah, unit, right. they're providing all the care for, okay. for children with complex needs. Yeah. In regards to the testing then, is that, are they going, is it a residential facility? Yeah, like, so there would be, there would, it's almost not respite care, but there may be a week and then come back into home. Right. They're going away at the weekend and coming back. So it's, right. it's just that they're moving between two. Okay. Not, it's not something that has come to our attention before. Or somewhere we'll look up, we'll look at now that you've raised it in the SGP. No, happy, happy to do so. I mean, I, I could give you sort of generic sort of answer to that, but I think you're looking for a specific answer, so it's probably best that we come back to you. And, and the PPE then with the trusts, try and chase that up a bit. Well, we will chase that up. If you have specific again, Paula, let, let us know, because there, there should be an easier flow Five weeks. For, what, for, for what we've established, or what we understand to be established. Okay, and the second um, is relation to, on Friday I got a... Uh, six weeks ago, I put in um, on behalf of whistleblowers some concerns about PPE and the Nightingale to the head of the health, Belfast Health Trust. So six weeks later, the day after they closed down the Nightingale, I got a response. So it wasn't only insulting to me, but it was insulting to those nurses who came to me with concerns. I'm concerned, therefore, that that secure email that you set up through which um, nurses could report issues with PPE. We haven't seen any evidence of the inquiries coming through and how they're being handled. So are you assured that that system has been working and that the nurses are being properly communicated and medics properly communicated with and who have raised concerns? In regards to your first point, was that, no, I'm that just was saying Belfast, that, I'm that just saying Belfast that, Trust? Yeah, that going even back to the, first, the um, initial point there about the systems are in place, but whether they're actually working is, I, I, is another your, matter. Your first point was solely to the Belfast Trust. So it wasn't yes, and this is about the, the okay. Belfast Trust. Well. No, the, 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 and I suppose one of the reasons we set up that anonymous email uh, account was so it could be anonymous. You know, So if we started to do um analytic I, I i haven't i've spoke to the chief nursing officer whose office is looking after it in regards to where we are in numbers um on very high level cases um or, or descriptions of, of what the concerns are um she's assured me that they are being addressed uh, and that's where i've left that responsibility because um as the chief nursing officer i can assure you she has nurses at her heart no i'm not follow up i can follow up and see and it is something that we set up within the department that anyone across the system could raise an anonymous concern. So it has it has worked to date. The numbers that uh, the number of contacts that we've actually received through it are um, lower than I was expecting. Okay. Much lower than I was expecting. But I am assured that there are there are answers and responses. And anything that needs followed up with a trust or a care provider, the chief nursing officer and one of our team is following up on those. Okay, and finally, very quickly, Chair, um, the mental health strategy, or sorry, action plan that came out yesterday was very much to be welcomed. I didn't see, in terms of the COVID-19 response, anything in relation to gambling addiction. I'm very concerned that there's a lot of people who are very vulnerable at home at the minute. They've been bombarded through virtual sites and um, TV ads. And they're at home, and I suppose this is something that I think is emerging as an issue within uh, mental health in terms of addiction uh, and mental health problems. And, and uh, you know, I think it's not just a COVID thing. Yeah, problem. Uh, you know, it's been there, it's been there in, in, in society for quite some way. I think the Department for Communities, uh, if I'm correct, was looking at updating legislation in regards to about the therapies to, to access. I uh, your to support <coughs> for gambling addiction. Yes, of course, we don't have anything in Northern Ireland specific for gambling addiction, but. You know, uh, for in regards to the policy development, it was DFC, and know they were working on it. And I'll check up to see where they where, where they currently are. But uh, 
we'll, we'll look at it as a specific. But, but, but can you look at the, yeah. this in oh, the sorry. spirit of the mental health services as opposed to the regs? Yeah, and, and I suppose one of the things that we made clear in the development of this, that this is a living document, you know, and that is one of the, the advantages we have from being able to move from this actually into the strategy, which will be long term, which is 10 years. So we, we've time to add to this and we would a lot of user input and co-production when we're actually developing this. Thank you. Thank you. Pat. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, Robin, I want to ask about contact tracing, but just before I, I go into that, uh, there's been some suggestion made that uh, your treatment at the committee has been uh, less than polite, it's been rude, and it's even been suggested that there may have been a bit of bullying. So uh, I know you're well up for this, that the, the powder puff treatment you get in here, you're well able for, and there's, there, there's, there's absolutely no problem. Uh, so I just wanted to put that on the record. And one of the difficulties we have, we have such a short time to ask questions. Sometimes we have to inter interrupt. If that appears rude, I apologise. It's not meant to be rude. It's just to get, get at, the, at the issues involved. One of, one of the unique things, and there are many unique things about this pandemic, is that this affects nearly everybody here. Uh, Alex mentioned his sister uh, was diagnosed with it. Other members are in the same boat. Others have elderly relatives, parents, grandparents, shielding, they're concerned about them, and so on. The kids are off school. Uh, as we sit here now, I have a long-time friend being buried in Milltown Cemetery. Jerry Higgins was a man. He's a few years older than me. Uh, I played Gaelic football with him in the same club. He also played uh, for the county, and he played Irish League football for distillery as well. He was a, a superb athlete. Great family man and, and, and a loyal friend. And, you know, we're all affected. And I don't want to know in five years' time, uh, Jesus, Jerry, Jerry Higgins could still have been alive if such and such a step had been taken. You know, I want, I want to know now. And, and all of us are eager for those answers. And there's nothing personal in this, uh, Robin. Uh, I mean, I play the ball, not the man. And, and, and I just want you to know that. But come back to the contact tracing. And, our responsibility as committee members is to scrutinise any policies or legislation that you bring forward and to hold you to account to that. And our job is to hold you account, and I'm sure you understand it. And if the tables were reversed, you would be doing the same with us, especially in the context of this uh, terrible disease that's, that's out there in the community at the time. And one of the problems we have is that the information we have been getting here has had gaps in it. It's been vague and in sometimes totally inaccurate. So the uh, CEO of the PHA was in here on the 16th of April. She told us that 500 people had been recruited and were currently being trained for contact tracing. When she reappeared uh, three weeks later and she was interrogated on that, she said she had spoken out of turn. So, we had assumed 500 people were in the process of being trained. And by the way, I welcome the start of, uh, of contact tracing. It's a good move. Some people believe it should never have been stopped, but that's a discussion for another day. Uh, also, some of the information is vague. I mean, when you were on yourself, Michael, or over the phone, and I, I, I can't remember which it was, uh, on the 23rd of April, I think it was, you said there were offers of 400 uh, people uh, to do contact tracing. And you know, I'm still not sure what that meant. Uh, and I mean, there's this issue of of when contact tracing stopped and on what basis it was stopped. And uh, you told us, Michael, it was done on the on the best scientific analysis and and sound public health principles. And that may well be true, but I don't know because I can't see the evidence, and you weren't prepared to give it to us. And I mean, I'm just not prepared to accept. Trust me, I'm a doctor. It's not good enough, and that's not us holding you, Robin, and your officials to account. So, in terms of contact tracing, uh, when did it stop, and when it did stop, how many were involved in contact tracing? Could you tell me that? And I'll start by, look, I'm no shrinking violet, I think you know that. I led the Austrian Unionist Party for two years, so trust me, there's nothing <laughs> that can be thrown at me in this room that I haven't had, <laughs> had elsewhere. But, you know, going back to your point, I, I think part of the frustration in um, the exchanges that we've had in this committee um, has been when we're not in the room. 
you mentioned it yourself, you know, trying, trying to have these exchanges, and I think it was one day you were actually in the chair, and I, I think Mike, Michael wasn't there, it was, it was only myself was doing it. And it, it was the frustration I was having, because I was doing it before, I couldn't see people's faces, I couldn't see where the question was coming from, I couldn't see where the answer was landing, so, you know, it was, it, we were talking in the blind. So, in regards to, to, to when it stopped, uh, on, on the 3rd of March, we got the part, you know, when the PHA were delivering on the 3rd, uh, 12th. 12th, there we go, I've got, that's the exact date. Uh, we were at a stage where PHA was doing this with a very restricted pool of people. So when we moved to complete lockdown and isolation, it proved then scientifically, whatever way it's presented, that it was no longer practical to do because where everybody was staying in the house. And, and not to interrupt you, but I understand that argument and it has been made previously. Yeah, whether I accept it or not is another matter, but I don't really want to go into that at this yeah. stage. But I'm just wondering how many people were involved in contact tracing at that time? I, I don't have that. I know they were, they were PHA. When I, when I went down... Um, do you have I, a rough figure? I, uh, put, put it this way, Pat, they were in a room no bigger than a quarter of the size of this chamber. So 10, 20? I'll explain why I'm asking. If, 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 if I said ten and it's twenty, Pat, can I get you the exact? Can I get you the exact figure and come back? Well, to I'm, I'm, I know I'm, what you're I'm, not, I'm not trying to pin you down to an exact figure, but, but what I'm trying to do is say to you that was nearly two and a half months ago. We now have fifty-eight yeah. who are actually trained to carry out contact tracing. There were a certain number back on the 12th of March, we were involved in it. So subtract that from 58, and in two and a half months, we have trained up whatever it is. Now, Michael, you said you reckoned we were going to need between three and 600 people involved in contact tracing. And I want to come on to the issue about a phone app later on, because if the phone app isn't suitable here, we're going to need more people, more uh, uh, personnel on the ground, to carry out contact tracing. So, if it has taken us two and a half months to train up, and let's just say for argument's sake, 40 people, and there are another 24 being trained, I don't know whether whether you, you read the document from the European Centre for Disease Control about contact tracing, and they say it takes between it should take between four and 20 hours to train a person to carry out contact tracing, and the Scottish government. Uh, put a public advertisement out uh, asking for people to come forward to do contact tracing. I don't think we've done anything similar, have we? Who, who is doing the recruiting for this? What we're actually doing, um, and again, it's a good conversation uh, we actually had with Connor Murphy in regards to as well, the Department of Finance, the Department of Finance and Personnel. So we're working with Connor because while we are in, in the restrictions we are, there's a number of civil servants actually who aren't being uh, deployed or, or utilised in their current roles because those parts and functions of government actually aren't working. So we're working with Connor at, at this minute in time. We have 800 volunteers yeah. who have come forward to support the staff um, that we currently have, have trained and tested. We have a small number trained and up and running now, Pat. Um, uh, I think we're 60 at this minute yep. in time with our cohorts and training and as I said to you in the chamber on Thursday we're looking at a central location as well so they're not all down in Lennon Hall Street in Belfast in case you know if, as I said if one centre gets infected we don't want, yeah. want the whole log going down but proportionally the number of tracers are and they're as proportional to the number of cases that we have so when we, we activated those 36 cases at the start of the week the 60 tracers that we have are more than enough to work through that system so as we go further down and go to lockdown we need to have a pool of people we can call in. It's not to having a bank of people just sitting there waiting on somebody to get a positive case. It's, it's a very fluid work, workforce, I suppose, is, is one of, of the better. Yeah, and I understand that. And as restrictions are eased, we can expect a raise in the yeah. number of yeah. cases. Yeah. Uh, and there may be clusters that need to be dealt with. And that's why we're doing, that's why the training work has gone on at this moment in time. That's why the second location is about to be signed off on as a, as a facility to use it. So it, it's, all, it's all falling into place. We went live at the start of this week. You mentioned Scotland uh, with the contact uh, or the Four Nations um, call uh, 
yesterday evening. Scotland's put out an advert for these people. We've started them working. You know, so that's that's uh, where we are in progress of that. In regards to the app, um, Who, who's actually recruiting them, Robin? Sorry, who's actually recruiting the contact tracers? PHA. Is the PHA they're themselves, or BSO, or? Well, BSO sign off. For yeah, Monday. I mean, obviously BSO will be involved in providing the support. There is a uh, an overarching uh, oversight board which I chair. There is a group within PHA which is looking at all elements of this, which has BSO support from the HR perspective. Uh, and just to put this into contact, I mean, you're absolutely right that we need to be able to dial this up and dial it down as the need requires. So the, the key in this is maximum flexibility, and it, you're, it, it absolutely crucially depends on the number of cases, at which at the, the minute it is relatively small. Uh, and, but also depends on the number of contacts, and as we step back some of the current uh, restrictions on um, in relation to uh, social distancing, etc., then the number of contacts per index case will increase. So therefore, the number of people that we need to do the contact tracing increases, and we have uh, graduated to do that. In terms of the estimates that I, I gave you last time, in terms of three to six hundred, what we have been doing, uh, Pat, just to reassure you, is we've been modelling, um, looking at. Uh, numbers of anticipated cases. We've planned on a reasonable worst-case scenario in terms of uh, looking at our, what the number of cases we might expect to see per day, and then looking at the number of contacts for each of those uh, ind individuals that we might uh, see. What we know at the moment is the average number of contacts uh, that we saw per case at present is about three. Uh, whenever we moved uh, on the 12th of March in Northern Ireland, it was about 10. So what we're doing is building an, in a degree of tolerance so that we're planning at the upper end of that so we have sufficient staff in place uh, to do the appropriate contact tracing. So there are three tiers to it, um, and I'd be very happy that we yeah, would share, we'll share that. We'll we'll share the detail. Earlier comments, there's three, okay. three, tier, right. three tiers to it. There's the expert public health for the really complex cases, and we're adding more public health consultants to do that. There's tier two, which is the contact tracers. 58, as the Minister said, are trained. It does take up to a day, and then they shadow for a day. 24 more training in this week. And then um, the, the, the sort of uh, tier three is the call handlers. Uh, and obviously, as you know, we have arrangements in place to call down contracts uh, to do that. We have the scripts written uh, for all of that. But just to reassure you, there is very, very detailed uh, planning uh, under underway. Uh, the final comment I would want to—I just want to thank you for your comments. Um, this this virus has cost lives. It's messed with our lives, but it's actually messed with all our heads. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Uh, you know, the way that we've been working has been, um, you know, highly unusual. Uh, you know, not being able to get into a room and have a conversation. Um, the last time we had a conversation, you know. It was your voice on the box. Uh, it, it, it is, uh, you know, it has been deeply difficult uh, when you're not in a room and, and, and making eye contact with people. And so, um, as, as I say, and if, if at times I've responded in a way which wasn't conducive to answering uh, uh, it, succinctly a question, then certainly then I've reflection to do there as well. Okay. And, and, and just, I want to, I want to say, Ram, we'll go ahead then. Sorry, no, no, no. P Pad raised the, you raised the app. Yeah. Um, our focus at this moment in time is on contact yeah. tracers. We want people on phones, but because of, of difficulties in the app, the uncertainties in the app, who owns the data, where the data doesn't lie. Um, at this moment in time, we've recommendations um, to the executive, the NHS Act, um, the, the UK app will go live here because we're part of it. So we're part of the UK, so we will have access to it, whether we want it or not. Well, could I just say? But what, what I will say, uh, it, it is up to anybody to download it. It's not compulsory. Yeah. So what we're looking at at this moment in time is to make sure that we have progress and work done uh, for a Northern Ireland version uh, that probably looks uh, so that it can interact with the Republic of Ireland one, because if it that, that's the one that makes. If it doesn't, Robin, it's not going to cut the mustard. And, that, okay. and we know that part, and that's why we want to put. Or that's why we're putting our focus and our recommendation to the executive, as our focus has to be on contact tracers yeah. rather and, than and relying it, on. Yeah. Uh, and an app would never replace that pen no, and pen, no, that's no, and and paper. And, 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 again, it goes back to our original point. It's the personal interaction. It's been able to talk to somebody on the phone rather than your thing 
provide advice and all. Um, and, and, and some of that speaks to the whole issue about if we don't have regular contact with yourselves, then these questions are piling up. Time gets short and all that. So we need to manage that a little better in moving forward. Uh, Alan? Sure. <clears throat> I'm going to quote uh, Minister uh, from uh, comments that were made by a, a political spokesperson uh, quite recently. Um, uh, maybe not quite for bottom, but pretty close. I think you'll get a flavour of, of the points that they were making. And they said, well, I think they were too focused on the hospitals. They were afraid of the number of patients who would be admitted into the Nightingale. A lot of the focus they talked about not overwhelming the health service, but they really weren't talking about not overwhelming our social care service at the same time. So I think that their focus has been much more on how many ventilators have we got, how are our wards reconfigurated in our hospitals, and they haven't been thinking about the most vulnerable people, very susceptible to infections in these clusterings of care homes. So I think they have been completely wrong in their focus from the start of this pandemic. I wonder how you would react to those comments? I, I don't know who or, or where they've came from at what point in time, Alan, but um, it's not something I would reflect as has been accurate within the department. Um, our, our focus has been since, since since the first case we got was about how we save lives across the entire health sector. Um, in regards to to focus on, on ventilators, um, when we looked across, I, I suppose when anyone looked across to where Italy was, where Spain was, the media, the public focus was on where ventilators were. It wasn't where, where we were focused. The department got on and done whatever it had to do behind the scenes. We dealt with the media inquiries and the, and the public face of the inquiry as, or sorry, the public face of how we challenged the virus as it came at us. Where, where the virus was in the media wasn't always where it was yeah. in the medical profession or, or in how we were treating it across the health service. So the media focus was often in a, in a different place um, than what the work that we were actually doing, but it didn't distract us. And it wouldn't I, distract I'd certainly, us. I, I would uh, disassociate myself personally from that criticism because I think that you were doing, uh, the department was doing their absolute best to prepare for a big surge and a lot of deaths, and I think you did all the right things uh, at the time. Uh, in terms of um, the uh, testing that you're going to do now in nursing homes, to be truly effective, how, what frequency do you see of testing having to be carried out in, in, in these homes? Uh, I mean, it, it, it can't be just a one-off. Is it going to be a rolling programme? And how often are you going to do it? And are you confident that you will get the cooperation of the patients and the staff uh, uh, for a rolling program to go in every fortnight and conduct a test that we all appreciate is is not a particularly pleasant test uh, uh, to be carried out. So, how frequently do you think you'll be going into and subjecting the the patients in in, in residence of care homes to this test? I'll, I'll let Michael pick up on the frequency, but the point you're making, you know, as to to the people who are tested, that's one of the things. We come for somebody to take a test, as I said to you, in the chamber on Thursday, and that's that, that, that's going to be the challenge. And I think it's also the challenge for for those elderly people who are who are in homes that are COVID-free, that that maybe are reliant on on a third party to to act on their behalf. You know, because these are inv we we are talking about an invasive test, so it's it, it's not something we can force. Upon anyone, I would advise, uh, you know, would advise as many people uh, in the care home settings uh, to avail of the testing because it allows us to give that that reassurance to them, to their families, and to the staff as well. But uh, but in regards to to frequency, um, yeah, I mean, it, um, it's a very good point. Uh, the right question, to which I don't have an answer at this point in time, although it is something we're very actively considering, and all the best international and, and other science available to us. Um, and our aim at the minute is to bring the existing uh, infections and outbreaks in care homes to an end in those care homes where there is none, 
to ensure, as the Minister mentioned earlier, that we prevent, and it goes back to Jerry's point, that we use intelligence to ensure that we prevent outbreaks in those care homes where there have been none, and we actually learn what the difference has been between the care homes that have had and those that haven't had, and there is obviously important learning there. Um, there is no doubt that um, you know, as infection in community falls, the risk to care homes lessens. Um, and there is absolutely no doubt that those working in the sector are doing their every, uh, everything they can to minimise uh, the risk to those that they care for, and they are to be commended for that. Um, in terms of the, the test, the, the frequency of the test not yet determined. Obviously, we can't test staff every day. Uh, and I think the Minister mentioned to a rolling programme. That has to be guided by the science and how frequently we would repeat tests. The other thing which we might need to combine that with is symptom checkers of staff um, and look at what combination of symptoms which would advise us and maybe different thresholds for testing uh, people in the community as opposed to testing in care home or in hospital sectors uh, so that you know, if you have certain symptoms uh, you have a test but uh, the evidence might suggest you'd be safe to, to work with certain safeguards or if you have this uh, group of symptoms stay at home until such times you have a test because the, the the once we get through this phase the challenge will be to ensure that we keep our care homes free of COVID um, and testing of staff will have a key part to play on that the, the, the issue around how frequent I don't yet have the answer to that, but we need the answer to that. We look at all the evidence. Okay, and I want to have a very a brief final comment, Chair. Very Just brief. With the recent relaxations of, of, of the restrictions, a lot of people are saying to me, and I'm sure to the rest of the committee, uh, why can you go and fish, and, and why can you go and shop at a garden centre or a recycling centre, but I can't go and visit my grandchildren? Um, can you confirm the message is still very firmly stay at home? We, we, are, we are moving into step one. Thank you. We haven't moved through it yet. All. And what I would say to, say to people and to the committee members as well, we need that message to still maintain that. We've taken, as an executive, uh, we've taken that first small step. Let's not start running, because once we start running, if this virus gets in front of us, we might not catch it this time. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to go to Orlea on the phone for a question. I'm going to give Paul a quick rate of response. Well, can I in, in get my response? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Obviously, you're talking about me. I stand over that. And the, the chief medical officer today has said that the priority was on the acute end of it. I stand over those comments. And I think if you had an issue, you should have came to me directly, as opposed to raising it at health committee. I stand through over those chair. comments. I think the I would really like chair, to remember. raise it wherever, wherever I the wish. Concentration wherever of I wish. Members, and the pandemic. Through the chair. And, and three, uh, and through the, the, chair, Paul. the chair. The, the chief medical officer said that this is a new. This is new. The, the international evidence, and you just used the word international evidence, would show that these pandemics around the world have always focused in on those institutional amplification settings. We cleared our schools, we got prisoners out, we stopped people going into pubs, we stopped the clusterings, but yet the surge plan put people into care home settings. So it was on that basis that I made those comments, and I stand 100% okay. on them. Okay, sure, I have a member on the phone. in this has... forum, not on the radio or in the media. I have a well, member. I to go on the radio. Okay, I'm going to our member who has been very patient on the phone, and I appreciate the fact that both of yourselves have remained on and have taken further questions beyond the time arranged. Um, Arlea, are you there on the phone, Arlea? Yes, sure. Thank you. I thought you forgot about me for a wee minute. Not for a second, Arlea. I, no. I, I know we're over time as well, so I'll just be really brief. Um, I have two questions um, for, for the Minister and for Michael. Uh, the first question, first of all, delighted about... Um, the announcement yesterday of the interim mental health plan. Um, I know there's been brilliant feedback already, Robin, from the, the perinatal mental health sector. So I was just wondering, um, do you know when we could expect to um, receive a decision on when that will be made on the, the, the perinatal mental health um, service model? That's my first question. And the second one is in and around the COVID-19 recovery. Um, I had heard yesterday at the All Party Group, which I was sharing on suicide prevention, um, that the silver cell is being established to look at the COVID-19 responses in relation to mental health, um, that that group still has to agree in terms of reference. And there was some confusion around if there was any representation from the community and voluntary sector on that silver cell group. 
Um, and then following on from that, then there has been some specific concerns being brought to my attention, more so from some of the grassroots community groups that they feel haven't been involved um, at that level and, and some worries that they weren't involved with the co-producing of the mental health action plan. But I know um, Robin, you had said earlier that obviously that's an ongoing um, piece of work, but any clarity on both those issues, thanks very much. Thank you, and I think it, you know. I think it was one of the first um, when we were first presented to this committee in regards to to COVID nineteen and where we were. And your specific question was in regards to mental health, and I gave you that commitment at that stage that it would not be that wouldn't would not be forgotten. So the work had been done in, in regards to to the to the the action plan uh, and where we move into the strategy. It was developed by co production, but as we move into the to the next step, you know, there, there's a further chance of engagement. In regards to the specific question into, into the silver cell, uh, that's an internal uh, management, I suppose, discussion um, delivery group within the department. So it wouldn't be normal that there would be would, would be third sector or voluntary and community groups in it. They will feed into how they interact and how they actually manage that. Uh, the, the perinatal uh, delivery plan will, again. This is still. That we're still subject to funding in this. Uh, the proposals will go in to make sure um, of the delivery. But as I said again, we had full executive support in regards to bringing this forward as part of new decade, um, new approach. Um, so, so the commitment is there in the delivery, and that, that I'm trying to get in the plan itself on the time scale of it. But that's a document I just can't put it, put my finger to it. Um, hold on. Right, and just as I say that, I have. Consideration of the business case for the very mental health services will be April 2020, an agreement on the new service model for spaces perinatal mental health services by September 2020. If you have the, the plan there, um, early as on page 21. Just on the, on the if I may, yeah. very briefly, or just in relation to the uh, Protect Life to Implementation uh, group. I mean, obviously, we need to continue on with important policy matters. I'm chairing a, a group of that coming up in the next. A uh, couple of weeks by either Zoom or Microsoft platform or some such mechanism, uh, and if there are issues which uh, any of the community groups want to raise at uh, at that meeting, or if you want to forward me any information in advance of that, I'd be very happy uh, to consider uh, those um, approaches and interventions. Okay, thank you. Perfect, Michael. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and thank you, members. Now there is an issue just want to have you both here that I want to raise as well on behalf of the committee and. You have already had an exchange of part there where you have you've explained and, and you have said you are around a long time, Robin, uh, you are involved in a lot of committees. The committee has asked on a number of occasions for pieces of information which have been slow at coming. On one occasion, on the 6th of April, we asked for an internal stock check which had been the, the subject of a media report the day before and which your department had responded to. We asked for that document. The date for that to be received should have been about the 21st of April. On the 14th of May, there was a response dated the 7th of May, and we were told that BSO would get that for us, despite the fact that BSO had been with us on the 30th. We asked for a strategy around testing on the 6th of April. We received a new strategy, but not the previous one. We asked for it again on the uh, again that was to be received on the 11th, and we then received an answer, but no documents. Just let me finish. Just let me finish the piece. The list of those forward them to me. I'm, yeah. I'm not aware well, of. But you see, in you see, in also on the on the 14th of April at the committee, I asked Michael. I asked you about what questions you had asked on the Sage Group. I asked that again in in the assembly. That we were sent an, a link to the Sage website that contains absolutely no answer to the question as to what questions you raised. So we're still outstanding that that information. And you see, if we're going to scrutinise things in real time. Because there, there is a fast-moving context here. So if documents don't come to us to three weeks later, of course they have time has moved on. That's why we need them in a timely fashion. So I think it's only fair that if we are if we are working with you, if we're if we're to have a positive impact, we need to get information quickly to us. You know, Chair, uh, you know, and I've sat, I've sat in your place in, in, in the Public Accounts Committee and the Women Learning Committee. I know that, and I know, you know issues like that were all, always raised through through the committee clerk with. With the uh, the DALO, uh, the Department of Assembly of the Liaison Officer, um, if those haven't been haven't been actioned or forward through through that system, you know, quite keen. I, I'll follow them up now, and if your if your clerk follows them follows them through to the DALO, we'll pick up on those those four pieces. And just finally, for me, um, and it's a quick one. 
Uh, you'd mentioned that there, the, the, a gradually, the Nightingale services run down, there would be a gradual return back to services. So when will we know what services are returning, uh, where those services are based and what the criteria will be and what the co-production with, with workers, with unions, with, uh, with uh, right, that co-production piece right across the sector, how will that and when will that be happening? There is already communication between the Department and the Trusts, and as, as I said in the statement, we have told Trusts if they can go ahead uh, of the Department and a collective response to re-engage some of those services, you know, go ahead, because our waiting list chair are something that we need, need delivery. And, uh, and again, it is not about the co-production of services, services that already stood down or, or scaled back, that, so we can get those re-engaged as, as quickly as possible. Okay. And finally, for me, and I will, I will let you go with this, is in relation to the stay-at-home scheme, you are aware we have uh, very many care home settings out there, a lot of people in precarious work and agency work and all of that. It is crucial that staff and unions are engaged in that piece of work around stay-at-home and that that is, that is done in a way that is truly voluntary and that there is no element of coercion or people who are in precarious work are f- are feel under pressure in relation to that stay-at-home scheme. Can we have that assurance? Is that the, sa- the safe at home? Yes, yeah, safe at home. Yeah, safe at home. Yes. Chaired, was it? You know, and we were heavily engaged. Um, with our trade union colleagues in this, and we, we weren't able to deliver it on, on the time scale we have because they did raise raise concerns. We, the, um, the between ourselves and the, the, the homeowners weren't able to address, and that's why we went to a public call. We have been working with a, a specific provider, which has a, a, a heavily trade unionised workforce, uh, and we we just couldn't get that agreement on the homes we were looking at. So that's why we put out the call now to any home that. That wants to engage in it. It is, of course, it's up to, it's up to staff to engage with the voluntary. It's it's us supporting the homes to deliver the service. It's not something that we're we're actually commissioning. That there's there's a pot of money there to deliver it. Which again, it's another step that we hope we can we can get us further down the road in this. Okay. Well, listen. Thank you for your appearance today. We hope to have you back soon. Me, just uh, could you indulge me for one second? Could I raise a piece of information? It's not a question. I'm not expecting an answer. If it's, if it's okay with the minister, I certainly pass. It's just in relation to a piece of research that's been carried out by Public Health England in the genome tracking in London, and it was in around six particular care homes in London. And the research showed that the virus was unwittingly being carried out, being carried into the care home by temporary workers who were in to replace other care workers who were self-isolating. And there's a similar situation here with agency workers moving from care home to care home. And I wonder, would you just uh, take note of that? I think part of the advice we've given, yeah. already given to care home yeah. providers is to look to minimise that as much as possible, because it's something we were, we're cognizant of. But we can we can do a further piece of reinforcement work on that as well. So no point well made. Okay. Chair, I think we're back soon. Well, in a couple of weeks, is the I'm thinking of. <laughs> that, that's more, and I think it's very important that, that these are, are regular now and kind of. Um, but listen, we appreciate we appreciate your time today. Appreciate your answers and your presentation. Um, wish you both well in, in the time ahead and the important work you continue to do. And we want to reiterate that message that is central to all of this: stay at home, maintain the social distancing, wash your hands, all the very basic stuff to to support the entire effort going forward. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. You. All the best. Thanks. Okay, members. Um, so, single item agenda today, obviously, and the only thing then is any other business. Has any member any other business today? Can I? Um, there was quite a, quite a lot of information there today, and the minister gave a commitment to come back with a lot of of information that he didn't have to hand, including stuff I had asked around direct payments. So I'm just wondering, are we going to put a list to him then for the, to get that follow-up, the guidance around death certificates, etc.? There's a lot of stuff there we need back. Yep. Chair, just so members know, we routinely write, every time there's a presentation, a letter goes from the committee by myself to the DALO, summarising what was offered or requested okay. by way of information. Um, ordinarily, there's a an agreement in place with departments in terms of the turnaround time for that, and that's why quite often the issues are then picked up in the oral briefing in a faster way, uh, potentially depending on who's before you. And um, so we've sought to get the letter off. 
but to say that if those answers can be brought uh, to the next briefing, so much the better. Okay. Okay. Um, the only thing in terms of any other business I want to do is just thank the committee staff for the speed at which they have put in place briefings, the additional meetings that we've been carrying out, um, the additional packs that are prepared and all that. There's a huge amount of work is in, and, and some of it has been very last minute in, in relation to some of the presentations. So on behalf of the committee, I want to thank all of you, yourself and all of your staff, Ailish, in relation to that. And just to say that our next meeting is tomorrow morning. Uh, in, uh, yeah, it's confirmed here in the Senate tomorrow morning. So we'll see you all again then, members. Please take care and safe home. Thank you. Thank you. The Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.